Hello, everyone. My name is Claire Baitosh. I'm an analyst at Ithaca SNR, a not-for-profit research organization. I work within our research enterprise program area, which is located within our library scholarly communication and museums team. Today, the title of my presentation is Keeping Up with Generative AI Products for Higher Education, Ithaca SNR's Product Tracker. Here's a brief outline of what I'll be speaking about in this video. I'll start by giving an overview of our Generative AI Cohort Project. Um, then I'll go into our product tracker, which emerged out of our work in the cohort project. And I'll conclude with a few trends in the product landscape that working on the tracker allowed us to see. So starting with our project titled Making AI Generative for Higher Education. This project brings together a cohort of 19 universities in the US and Canada to collectively assess how generative AI is affecting the teaching, learning, and research missions of institutions. In other words, we are collectively gathering actionable evidence that will, will allow higher education institutions to take proactive, strategic steps in response to generative AI. The research that we are performing together will lead up to the institutions in our cohort deciding on a strategic intervention to implement at their institution. Listed on the slide are key components of our project. Firstly, iterative research on practices, policies, and products, which is what I'll be saying more about in my presentation today. Qualitative inquiry into emerging norms, practices, and support needs. Um, consulting and co-learning to develop responsive policies and resources. This is in reference to how the knowledge sharing we do in this project will help institutions take strategic steps. And finally, what we learn in this project will be shared with the wider higher ed community as we will be publishing our findings. One of the first things our cohort did last fall after this two-year project kicked off was conduct assessments of usage patterns, perceptions, and support needs in relation to generative AI at their institutions. They used a variety of methodology. Some of them are listed here, such as campus-wide surveys, um, focus groups, community dialogues, or infor informal conversations with key stakeholders on campus. Here are a few of the trends that emerged from their findings. Firstly, there's a widespread variance in terms of how familiar folks were with AI and generative AI among faculty, staff, and students. This was particularly notable among students who are often believed to be far ahead in their familiarity. And even if they were sometimes a bit ahead, there was still a strong fear that came out among students of accidentally, quote unquote, doing something with generative AI that would be considered plagiarism. There's also widespread desire, again, from faculty, staff, and even students for resources and support, be it training, guidance on appropriate uses, ethics, et cetera. And students, while often shown to trust AI a bit more than faculty and staff, were often also aware of ethical issues and wanted guidance on appropriate ways to use generative AI. All in all, this leads up to an urgent need for AI literacy. There are many examples we hear of, of instructors doing activities incorporating generative AI to try and teach their students to critically evaluate its outputs this taking steps towards AI literacy, but there's definitely a wide demand for more, again, across students, faculty, and staff. Finally, one more thing that emerged was that there's a, folks seem to be using general purpose tools more than discipline-specific ones. The two that came up most were ChatGPT and Grammarly, the latter mainly being among students. And this is, these assessment exercises 
were used just to gather some baseline knowledge going into the interviews that all the schools in our cohort are now performing with um, researchers and instructors. So as I mentioned when introducing the project, iterative research is a key part of it. And one area our team at SNR has been following closely is the landscape of generative AI products for higher education. So to get a more holistic picture of this landscape, we created a generative AI tracker, which we originally shared amongst our cohort of collaborating universities last fall. They had a very positive reaction and we released it to the public in March. The tracker is limited to certain generative AI products. It specifically lists products that are explicitly marketed towards post-secondary students or faculty and or appear to be in active use by post-secondary students or faculty for teaching, learning, or research activities. There are certainly other users of Gen AI in higher ed and um, other types of tools, but for the purpose of our project, we had focused on those geared towards researchers, teachers, and students in terms of users. The tracker is a living document, which we update regularly as new products enter the market or new information about existing products becomes available. And our target audiences for this tracker were firstly end users, instructors, researchers, students who would be making choices about products, and then decision makers at universities to be well better informed about the landscape when making choices themselves. Uh, and on the slide, side of this slide is a screenshot of the tracker. Um, you can access the tracker on Ithaca SNR's website under the Publications tab, where it was published along with an issue brief on the product landscape. Thus far, I'll add, we've had a very enthusiastic response to the tracker. So here are just a few features. This is a description of the kind of information our tracker includes. The tracker is broken down into several categories for the convenience of the reader. Um, general purpose LLMs are towards the top. Then there's a category for products geared towards teaching and learning, ones used for coding, for writing tasks. So they're, they're organized around use cases. The tracker always includes a brief description of the product. It adds on key features. We provide any available information about the pricing model, usually linked to it when it's available. If there are particular standout qualities of the product in a positive sense, or if it has notable limitations, we'll list those as well. And whenever available, we try and include other background information on the product, whether it be more background on the vendor themselves, or for example, if it's a discovery tool, what corpus of content it's drawing on. Um, if we know what LLMs are behind the tools, we will mention that. Um, we also include external links in the comments section to helpful blog posts or video demos related to the product. Um, so as I had mentioned, alongside our product tracker, we also published an issue brief on the product landscape, which aimed to enrich, synthesize, and comment on what we saw in the product tracker. So this slide and the next several, I'll talk through, I'll draw from that issue brief, which is on our website under the publications tab. So our issue brief, one of the main things it did was propose a typology of products. It's a little different than the section headings within our product tracker, as here we settled on three broader thematic categories that aim to capture the core functions of generative AI tools as they are currently serving instructors, researchers, and students. The three types we settled on were discovery tools, understanding tools, and creation tools. And I'll say off the bat too, there's certainly overlap between these types, which I'll get into. So here I'll start with discovery. Generative AI powered discovery tools allow users to mitigate, mitigate information overload by more efficiently identifying content relevant to their needs. 
conversational or chat-based discovery also so far appears to be a very desirable feature for users. Discovery products geared towards higher ed are often grounded in specific databases, generally cite their sources in generated responses, and this has been something that's made them more appealing so far than ChatGPT, which became famous for hallucinating citations, of course, as we all know. Um, discovery tools can distinguish themselves based on the content they draw on. For example, if users know their search is drawing from high quality vetted content, that can be a plus. And as you'll see, I don't have too many examples of pure discovery tools here, because as I mentioned, there's a fair amount of overlap in this typology and many discovery tools we found incorporate other key um, types from this typology, which I'll move on to now. So understanding, more than just enhancing traditional search, vendors are using generative AI too as we put it in our issue brief, blur that line between the initial act of identifying and accessing relevant sources and the subsequent work of reading and digesting those sources. Interestingly, existing research on how generative AI is being used in higher ed has indicated that these kind of understanding use cases are very prevalent, especially for students. So it's unsurprising that this is a significant portion of the product landscape. So helping users understand relevant material through summarization and synthesis is the core value proposition of many of these products. Um, the first two billets uh, are examples of those under the examples uh, column. There's also a market for products that allow users to upload and query or get summaries of scholarly material that they have already identified as relevant from their to their needs externally products listed in the third bullet of example under the examples would would be products that do this kind of thing and then some products in the space um, aim to enhance learning workflows there are some that specifically are aiming to enhance student learning such as Clairvate's Aletheia or Cortex Premium um, in the case of Aletheia doing things like asking students questions to get them to think deeply about their reading, or in the case of Cortex, generating study notes and summaries. Then also translation is another way we can, another feature that comes up in tools as usually one feature among others in these cases, um, and also facilitates understanding such as with the Audemic tools. Finally, creation. Of course, content creation or generation is central to the definition of generative AI, so certainly present across all products. In this category, however, what we aim to do was single out products whose primary function for teachers, researchers, or students is that raw generating text, images, code, etc. So text generators in particular aim to help simplify the process of moving from unformed ideas to polished writing through features like idea generators for brainstorming or sentence autocomplete. Certain products such as Curie and Writeful are catered specifically for academic writing and revise structure and terminology accordingly. Uh, other products boast publication readiness checks uh, for publication in scholarly journals. There are also products out there that are aimed towards instructors to use to generate course materials. This could be lesson plans, worksheets, quizzes, slide decks, etc. The very last bullet here that we have under the examples gives a few examples of this kind of thing. Finally, I wanna conclude with sharing just a few of the trends and questions that we identified in our issue brief. And this, these were all gathered from the big picture view of the product landscape that our tracker granted to us. So firstly, as the tracker demonstrates, the current generative AI product market for higher education is crowded and may even continue to grow. We notice that 
there were products that certainly were fairly similar in terms of their core functions, that products that were going to last would need to distinguish themselves in their value propositions. One would expect to see con consolidation among products, um, either from those who aren't able to distinguish themselves in their value propositions or because they end up being acquired by bigger players in the market. Distinguishing features might be the quality of content tool draws on, if it's a discovery or understanding tool, for example, or how comprehensive and expansive the content they draw on is. Secondly, tools that are embedded or can be embedded in larger platforms, especially in learning management systems, might end up having an advantage through their ability to reach more users. There are also products that are in, that in, in themselves present themselves as platforms made up of different features that otherwise might have been marketed as separate tools um, and will also have appeal in that way. Finally, though it probably goes without saying, um, there's a widespread reliance on open AI services across the board. The GPT models are behind much of these products, um, sometimes in combination with other AI technology. And we'll also note that it's difficult to know what the future market price will be for open AI services. So there's a fair amount of uncertainty, both from vendors, I'm sure, and also from the users we've identified regarding what the financial burden will be even for universities who are signing up for services. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you so much.